started here. Uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed their lunch. Um, I'm Joe Bolick with the Ivoice Reduction Center and today we are here for the um, food waste solutions in the industrial and commercial sector. We have a lovely panel of some very generous uh, panelists here and uh, we've got Bruce Taylor and Alex Poldman. Uh, we have Michelle Boney and Dave Morgan. Um, Michelle's going to start off. She's the Director of Environmental Health and Safety for West Liberty Foods in West Liberty, Iowa. She's responsible for the safety, health, environmental management programs, environmental compliance, and sustainability programs for the, for the entire corporation. Um, she's RIB certified uh, lead auditor, and she serves as the board of, on the board of directors as the president for the Iowa Sustainability Business Forum. And she's going to share a little bit of her stories of what she's doing with West Liberty Foods. So without further ado, here's Michelle. Yeah, I think it's on. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Um, and like uh, um, they said, that I am the director of environmental health and safety. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about West Liberty Foods, who we are. processors that we have a lot of food waste we don't have a lot of food waste we u we utilize that food waste um, some of our uh, food waste from production is a commodity and it's sold for the pet food industry um, they also make makeup and other things out of that uh, um, food waste that comes out of our facilities what we had food waste for is more out of our cafeterias um, where people are bringing in their lunches and things like that um, West Liberty Foods is a landfill free company. We became landfill free in 2012. Um, from the start of when our, our president and CEO went to a Frito Lace conference, he learned from them that they were a zero waste and he was very impressed with that and came back and called us and said, Hey, Michelle, how, so, how soon can we be landfill free or zero waste? And I said, I don't, I don't know why we couldn't do it. And he said, let's do it in a year. So we, we, we accomplished that in a year. Uh, so I'm just going to go over. Uh, we are also third party certified by NSF International. Um, they are also our registrars for ISO 14001. Um, but the certificate reads that less than 1% of our waste can end up in a landfill in any way. And that means that even if we go to a waste energy facility, if they burn the, the waste, they have ash that's left over. That ash uh, is taken to landfills as cover, so I, I account for that ash. So when I say that we have less than 1%, that includes that ash. Here's just some data that um, for 2016, we have to keep track of every single waste stream that we generate. We generate over 65 waste streams at the West Liberty facility alone. Um, each one of those waste streams are tracked. Um, the vendor is tracked, who it goes to, what we're doing with it, is it composted, is it recycled, is it uh, waste to energy, what is it, um, and where does it go. So these are some numbers. We generated 72,915 tons of waste going out of, that, out of those facilities. 
Um, out of that, composting in tons was 174.23 tons was composted. Now composting for us is also paper towels. And in a food industry, we use a lot of paper towels because our, our team members have to wash their hands all the time for food safety. So we generate a lot of those paper towels and that goes to the composting as well. Um, wax cardboard is also a compostable material that comes out of our facilities and goes there. Um, along with the food from our cafeterias. And we collect those foods and uh, Green RU is one of our vendors and they helped us. Um, they have orange containers. They are color coded at our facility for the landfill free. And orange is our composting <coughs> color. And all of our team members know that and they put their um, compostable materials in there. <coughs> we recycled 70,132 tons out of that 72,000. Um, and 61.35 <coughs> tons went to landfill. This was uh, um, based on that incineration and any of that uh, um, ash that was coming from it. That's where that was coming from in the tons. Waste energy was 2,027 tons. And that was just in the year of 2016. We do our, our um, landfill free as in a calendar year. And they told us to keep it short, so I only have three three slides. <laughs> then we'll leave the questions still. Yeah, then we'll leave the questions. If you have any questions, let's hold on to them, and at the end we'll do them. That way we can have everybody kind of provide their answers. Thank you, Michelle. Um, next up we have uh, Bruce Taylor and Alex Poldma. They are both with Enviro Stewards Incorporated. Um, Bruce is a professional engineer with over 27 years of experience in both <coughs> conservation, energy efficiency, pollution prevention, toxic use, re toxic use reduction, and treatment process design. Um, founder and president of Enviro Stewards Incorporated, an engineering firm and certified B Corporation that helps clients increase their profits, sustain the environment, and compellingly benefit society. Um, he's received numerous awards in the field of pollu pollution prevention, both in Canada and in the United States. Enviro Stewards has been selected as one of the best companies for the world, and several of its projects have received national sustainability awards. Uh, international development work includes earthquake relief in El Salvador, cleaner production training in La Laos, Laos, sorry, and establishing sustainable safe water project with uh, ventures in, in Africa. Alex is a project engineer. Uh, with Enviro Stewards and has led multiple resource conservation projects at Canadian food and beverage manufacturers um, such as Maple Leaf Foods, Maple Lodge Farms, Southbrook Vineyard, and Calgary Italian Bakery throughout his three years with Enviro Stewards. So please let's welcome uh, Bruce and Alex to talk a little bit about what they do as the, at the consulting level. So uh, we're going to give a brief presentation just kind of uh, I'll just lay the groundwork and Alex is going to outline the approach that we use to do this type of work and then we're going to uh, provide some case studies to give you practical examples at the end. Um, basically we're a small company up in Elmira, Ontario um, and uh, we're a certified B corporation as you mentioned. And we're all um, aligned on this mission that we want to benefit society and environment. And so uh, the Safe Water Project you mentioned, so once a year, I go to South in Africa, and we teach the people there how to build these water purifiers. So uh, basically, that's a steel mold, the blue thing, and you uh, make that cement thing, and you fill it with gravel and sand, and you grow the natural bacteria that eat the other bacteria. And basically, uh, it's 10 times less expensive than what these families are presently spending on medicine or typhoid and all that. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, and so that's what that is, and then we, a ring of this, we teach them how to run a business. So Matthew, the third one from the left, is actually the owner and manager of that, you know, locally owned and operated project. And then uh, they make them and they sell them locally. He's now technically a refugee in Uganda because of the war in South Sudan. But contrary to a normal perception of a refugee, he's actually employing 45 Ugandans and he's given 3,000 Ugandans safe water since February, right? And so, anyway, that's kind of illustrate. Uh, we do a lot of food and beverage type experience. Uh, work. We also do aerospace. We've worked at NASA, Boeing, Bombardier, other places like that. But uh, with respect to food, so in Canada, $31 billion of food is thrown away every year. And where we work in South Sudan, Africa, people are literally starving to death because they don't have food. Right? And so aside from the financial argument that we're going to make here, there's a social 
And of that, 18% is lost during the manufacturing process. And so it's interesting because, you know, we talk about reduction, reuse, and whatnot, but really we just, we move pretty quickly on to the, from the prevention side. And uh, we want to show you why it's relevant. Most factories think they've already done that. We, you know, uh, I'll show you an example of Campbell Soup. You know, we've been making soup for 100 years. Obviously, we've done that. But we'll show you kind of, uh, if you're open to change, what, what can happen. So one of the main problems is people think of food waste as, OK, it costs me $70 a ton to send it to landfill, $80 a ton if I compost it, or $100 a ton if I send it to a waste energy plant. No. It costs you $8,000 to buy that mozzarella. It costs you $10,000 a ton to buy that chicken. Yes, it also costs you $100 to destroy it. But first of all, you're paying somebody to destroy something you bought for $10,000. So it's on the wrong spot on the balance sheets of every industry. Every industry thinks that it's how much it costs them to destroy it, either by paying a sewer surcharge or paying a landfill or composting for your waste energy. But it's not. So that's one of our first goals is we have to help people understand what it actually costs them. Because otherwise it's not worth their time. I'll show you an example of Campbell's in a little bit where it was um, chicken. So they were losing 13 tons a year of chicken. Okay, that's $1,300 a year to send it to our waste energy plant. And it's making green biogas anyway. No, it's $130,000 worth of chicken that you're then paying somebody $1,300 a year to de destroy for you. Once you do that, okay, yeah, it is worth my time, right? So our number one problem is, first of all, getting people to actually understand what it actually costs. And so the way we prove is don't manage your food waste, prevent it in the first place, right? And again, as an engineer, we're very attracted to shiny objects. <laughs> so all the objects at the end of the pipe are shiny. I can build you a biogas plant. I can build you a composting facility. I can build you a cogen plant to make your energy more efficiently. I can do solar panels. Right? Not using it is less sexy. Okay, let's just change it like this so we don't need it in the first place. And so it's a mind shift also of the engineers that's needed. Uh, there's the hierarchy, reduce, reuse, and recycle kind of thing. Um, provision Coalitions and Association of, uh, Indus of Food Associations, and they hired us to develop a toolkit that's available for free on their website to any food and beverage manufacturer on how to do this type of audit. Um, so basically, Typically, we don't just do food waste on its own. We do it in the context of energy, water, food waste, pollution prevention, because you're there anyway. You might as well solve all these problems. And you don't solve one problem by creating another one. Um, and I'm going to get Alex to just walk through our approach, and then I'll tie up with some case studies at the end. All right, so like Bruce mentioned, uh, what we do is often holistic. So we look at energy, water, and food waste. So this approach here can be applied to all three of those, those facets. And we like to call it who, what, why, where, and when. So the first step is who, so making sure that we gain buy-in. So when we go to a facility, um, we like to get a team together to make sure that they're on board uh, with the project and with this concept of change moving forward. Also, the team at the facility, they're the experts. They know the processes, they know the equipment, they know all that stuff. So this is a really important first step for us. Um, next is what? So collecting data. So we have these flow meters that look at water flow. We have these amp loggers that measure electricity. And then we also measure food waste uh, by just weighing food waste essentially. And this is a really, really important part of the puzzle because a lot of people in the facilities know that, you know, there's waste generated here, there's waste generated here, but they don't know how much and how much it costs. And that'll come very apparent when we walk through some of our examples. So this is a really important part of the process for us. Once we collect our data, we make these Pareto charts. So these could be your top food waste producers in terms of a process. Uh, it could be your top water consumers, top energy consumers. And so this is how we focus in on certain processes to look for opportunities. Once we look at where there are these wastes being produced, we look at why. So really look at the root cause. And if we can identify the root cause and solve it as far upstream as possible, the solution becomes quite lucrative, actually. So for example, this is a uh, fork processing facility. And so they have a centrifuge that processes lard. 
and it spits out some lard and solids into a tank. And so that overflows and goes into the drain. So when we were there, we noticed that there was 22 liters a minute of hot water <coughs> going down the drain, so about five gallons a minute of water. And so we asked the operator, you know, why is that water going down into the drain? Well, if there's no hot water going to the drain, the lard will solidify and clog the drains and have a huge problem. So it's a really small cost for the facility to avoid a much larger problem. What happens is all that water, the lard and the solids go down into your wastewater treatment plants. That needs to be operated and then there's a waste hauling cost associated with that as well. So if you look at it in a holistic perspective, you find different answers. You can heat that water more efficiently or you can reuse that water from somewhere else. But if you go upstream and solve the problem upstream, you come out with a really different result. So our solution here was to heat trace the tank, let the solids settle in the tank, reprocess that lard, and completely eliminate the hot water source in the first place. So what that ends up happening is that's $100,000 a year of water, natural gas to heat that water, and actually lard that you can sell instead of having to pay to get rid of downstream. So again, if you, if you can catch it as far upstream as possible, the project becomes pretty lucrative, actually. So once we collect our data, come up with our ideas to, um, for these opportunities, we have the when portion, which is the, the capital cost and the payback and whatnot. So we present to our clients, here's the capital cost associated with this project, here's the payback based on our measurements, our data collection, and so here's your, your payback period, here's your return on investment, and they can decide, is this a project we're going to do immediately, is this a 2018 project, a 2019 project? So that's kind of our approach, and then it kind of yields some really, really nice results. So I'm going to talk about a few bakeries where we did this food waste prevention. And so the first bakery, they have these pans where they put the dough into. It goes through a proofer, it goes through the oven, and then the, the buns actually get removed and then packaged. But we noticed that 3.5% of all buns in the line we're getting stuck to these pans because of glazing issues. What would happen is you take these, the operator would take these pans, throw out the buns, put new dough on the pans, and go through the process again and again and again. So you're constantly losing 3.5% of all of your product there. So the solution could be obvious, could be not, but once you actually quantify the problem, it makes it a lot easier to actually pursue, was to purchase some extra plant, uh, pans that were glazed, and every time an operator sees this scenario, remove the buns, take out that pan, put in a new pan, the old pan will go for reglazing. So it's just a procedural change that tackles a pretty big problem at 3.5% of all their buns. <coughs> Another uh, relatively obvious uh, solution, I guess, would be there's this conveyor that takes bread dough up, up to another process. And sometimes when there's not enough flour on the bread dough, it sticks to the conveyor and falls down this, this ramp and hits the ground. And so really the root cause there is, is a lack of flour on the bread dough. Uh, but there's also no catch tray. And then oftentimes they reprocess a lot of their dough, they can capture it. So a simple solution here, install a catch tray, reprocess that dough, and then in the future, I guess, you can investigate the flour coverage at the actual former. But it's a pretty quick solution. It's 13,000 kilograms a year of dough waste, valued at $10,000 a year. So for a small bakery, that's a lot of money, actually, a lot of waste. Here's another interesting one. Um, so another bakery that produces bagels. So they have this conveyor that's three times wider than the actual bagel is. They have a seed hopper that drops the seeds onto the bagel that's also three times wider than the actual bagel is. So the Every time for the process, two-thirds of your seeds are just hitting the conveyor, hitting the ground, and being thrown out. So in a year, that's 25,000 kilograms of sesame seeds, which is $66,000 a year. And the cost to essentially make that seed hopper smaller is minimal, and the payback is actually very, very quick. So again, people know this is happening, they see it, but they don't know how much it costs them. They don't know how to quantify, and they don't, uh, do anything for this problem because they don't know what it costs them $66,000 per year. 
Uh, my last example, again, at, at the same bakery with those bagels, there's these things called baseball bagels where there is no hole. I think I'd actually prefer that because my cream cheese wouldn't build up in the middle. But they can't, they can't sell this product because aesthetically it doesn't look like a bagel, I guess, or a proper bagel. So what's the root cause of these, these baseball bagels? It's actually inconsistency in the mixing and proofing process. So we did some amperage logging on the mixer. And if you see those, uh, those troughs there, the duration varies every single time. So you have some bagels that proof for longer than others. And then they have these baseball bagels that form down the line. So only 75,000 kilos a year of these baseball bagels, but it costs 25,000 a year because that's all the energy embedded into this. Your sesame seeds are already on top of your, your bagel. So it ends up being quite costly, actually. Solution, pretty simple. It's a procedural change in the facility. Project cost is internal, really, and the payback is quite immediate. So once we identified this, the bakery made these changes the week of kind of thing. So those are some examples. They seem pretty obvious at some points in time, but the idea there is to actually put a number to the waste. And then that makes it more, um, more urgent, I guess. So I'm going to pass it on Bruce for some more examples. Sure. Uh, so I have two more examples. One is a dairy, and one is uh, the Campbell soup I mentioned. So this is a uh, dairy in Quebec, and that's mozzarella cheese on that upper belt. It's coming down to this lower belt here. So every piece of cheese they make falls down there, and a little piece falls off and goes onto the tray underneath there. But they don't feel too bad about it because they take that tray and they send it over and they make processed cheese out of that. Okay? So everybody in the factory knows this is happening, but they, what they don't know is what it costs them. So I took one of these blocks off, put it on the scale, put it back on, let it fall, five grams. If you multiply that by all the cheese they're making, and the difference in value between if you sell it as mozzarella or processed cheese is $70,000 per year. So for $70,000 a year, can we modify this conveyor, right? So it's a problem that everybody can see, but they just can't see what the dollars is associated with it. Butter. So they got a new process for making the butter, and they put it in the old location. And what happened was um, the butter transfer line at the end of the run is full of butter. And so they push it out with steam, and again, that goes in a bin, and they make processed cheese out of that. However, if we just go directly, and we pay for some extra piping just to go directly instead of using this old path, you can cut the length by two thirds. So then you cut the amount of butter that's being turned into processed cheese by two thirds. $50,000 a year. So what also people don't realize is $50,000 a year, how much butter do you have to sell to make 50,000 profit? Right? This is on the margin, right? Uh, similarly, they're making uh, spring cheese. At the end, this melter is full of cheese that they're sending to landfill. In that case, we said, okay, let's take that out with make processed cheese out of that one, right? $117,000 worth it, 27 times a year. Uh, so Campbell Soup, so they've been making soup for 100 years, and um, they're very good at it. And, but even so, they were still open to change. So they um, called us up, they said, can you do a quote for a solid waste audit? Said, sure. They called me up 20 minutes later, don't bother quoting, our solid waste company is going to do it for almost nothing. Okay. So the solid waste company did it, they said, yeah, well, here's the report, it's not very exciting. 1% of our food waste was going to the landfill. They're saying, okay, let's take that and send it to the waste energy plant along with the other 99% that you're already sending them. So then they hired us to do a food waste prevention audit. So when you do a solid waste audit, you go to the dumpster, you find out what's in there, and you find the best home. We don't even look in the dumpster. It's too late by then. We go back in the process. Where did it fall off the line? So right here, those are carrots. So you've grown it, you've washed it, you've peeled it, you've diced it, and it goes through this optical set, sort. If it sees a bad one, a puff of air spits it, it goes straight down the sewer. Nobody ever sees it again. So we put a bin under there. How much is it? And then we put our hand in there. Oh, three quarters is actually good carrots that are collateral damage whenever you spit out a bad one. We took that bin, put it back through the same machine, and two thirds of it passed, which is 500 tons per year of carrots and potatoes that were going down the sewer, coming out on the screen, going to the waste energy plant. Which is a quarter 
million a year worth of vegetables. But again, people don't feel too bad because we're making waste energy out of it, right? But what they don't realize is, by it was 50 tons a year of greenhouse gas associated with the waste energy. It's 4,000 tons per year of the greenhouse gas of growing and processing the vegetables to the point that you put it down the sewer. So that's 100 times greater benefit by selling this food instead of destroying it. Um, so they're making the chunky soups there. So basically at the end of the run, well there's two problems there. One, <coughs> um, whether or not there's a can there. If there's no can in the line, it was dropping chicken and whatnot on the belt anyway, right? The second problem was at the end of the run, you're out of soup stock. So basically what you do is you take this can, you put the expensive stuff in first. So it drops the chicken and the vegetables and the pasta in there. Then it checks its weight and then it goes over further and it puts the broth in, puts the lid on it, pasteurizes it. So at the end of the run, they're out of soup stock, you still got chicken on the belt, which is now waste, right? So basically all we did was, let's put a sensor there so that we know when we're going to get to the end and we stop putting chicken on the belt automatically. Right? And this was the one that was 13 tons a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, except that's $130,000 worth of chicken. Right? Uh, 171000 for those changes there, 13 tons a year. And so, what pe most people don't realize is preventing the problem is actually at least 10 times more lucrative than managing it more effectively later on. Many of those examples are 50 times, so 50 times more. Similarly, we've done wineries. Originally, they hired us to design a wastewater treatment plant, an anaerobic plant to destroy their wastewater. We cut the wine losses by two-thirds. We built a plant half as big. Capital cost was one and a half million cheaper than the original. Plus, they get to sell the wine. Um, Conservation is one of the most lucrative, you know, when, when you go through the economics on these, uh, the one, one of the wineries we just did the payback was two months. Where can you find an investment that's going to make you 500% return on your money every year for the next 20 years? You're not going to find it on the stock market. Invest in your own factory. And if you look at the whole thing, systematically you can find some good gains. <coughs> so, thank you, little question for you. Thank you, Bruce and Alex. And last and certainly not least, we have Dave Morgan. He's a native, Iowa native, and from uh, an alum of the University of Northern Iowa, so we've got to give him a little bit of credit for that. Um, he's got, got a degree in business administration, and back in 2012, he founded Single Speed Brewery, uh, Brewing Company in Cedar Falls. Small brewery in Cedar Falls, and then earlier this year, um, you know, Alex, you talked about a bakery and bread, that it made me instantly think of Dave, which I'm sure I'll tell about a little bit. He uh, opened a second location of Single Speed Brewery in Waterloo, Iowa, uh, by converting an old Wonder Bread factory into a uh, wonderful, uh, beautiful brewery. Uh, both of Dave's breweries are certified through the Iowa Green Brewery Certification Program by the Iowa Waste Reduction Center, uh, with the Cedar Falls location achieving a silver level and the Waterloo location receiving um, the very highest level and the only platinum that we have issued with that certification. So congratulations on that. And without further ado, Dave Morgan. I'll joke, keep that up. I gotta have a little bit of beer. <laughs> Hope nobody's offended. I was telling the small group that was in here earlier, uh, so I don't speak a lot. One, um, two, I typically speak at uh, brewery conventions, so everybody has beer. <laughs> um, so I didn't, uh, I would have not have committed to this. Uh, not being allowed to share some beer and to have a little beer while I speak, you also would not have enjoyed it. <laughs> because it's not really my jam, but I can do this, so uh, I want to start by saying this is super cool. Like you guys probably noticed that I was paying, or maybe you didn't, but like really close attention while these guys talk. So the last couple of years, I've been spending a lot of time trying to learn about um, this kind of stuff and what these people do. and. Uh, once a year, I get to hear like really, really smart people talk about this stuff. And a lot of the simple concepts that you see we incorporated here come from hearing like tales like this. And, and, and so for me, so far it's been cool. Let's see how it goes from here. Uh, that's our brewery. I'm just going to talk about our brewery a real little bit and then talk about the simple things that we did to that, that makes sense from an environmental perspective as well as a cash flow perspective. 
My mic okay? You guys hear me all right? Okay. So brewery, yeah. Uh, forward? Yeah. 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 Operating. So the signage stays, which we're cool with. Now let's add our little signage on the corner. All right, background check. Founded in 2012, like Joe said, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Um, 1,700 square feet, three barrel nano brewery. Uh, we have about 40 seats. We're currently Iowa Green Brewery certification silver there. What we've learned in the last few years should allow us to go gold there um, once we make some adjustments. Um, our focus has been on the other facility, as you'll see. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to get platinum there. It'll be a, it'd be a stretch, but I mean, who knows? We'll try it. In April of this year, location number two was opened. Not exactly organic growth, 35,000 square feet at this one. Um, it's a 20 barrel brew pub with a beer hall. You see people there having pints. You guys are having pints too, so I don't feel bad showing you that. <laughs> um, lead certification is silver and projected. I just got some documents to sign today. We feel good about that. Um, one of the things I'll speak on briefly about lead certification is it forced us, it forced us to think about the decisions we were making as we were renovating this building. A lot of the same things that maybe now is drilled down, as Bruce was talking about, it makes you really, it makes you really think about your decisions. And then you have somebody in the room that was smarter than you that could tell you, hey, I think you should go this way. Here's your return on investment. Here's your cost. None of them were two months. Bruce is right. <laughs> um, but you know, we set like the number at like seven years. Um, anything that we could get our money back in seven years and then we produce revenue for us after that was that was what we dialed in on. But I would not have been, I'm not qualified to make those decisions without guidance. So hiring a lead, a lead consultant, a lead expert was, was critical for us. Um, not free, of course, but you know, you, you factor that into the ROI as well. Um, it, it helps make a lot of really, really good decisions. And the bottom one, super important to us, Iowa Green Brewery Certification Platinum, which is great. So landfill diversion, that's what we talk about a lot when we talk about a room like this. Um, if we're not going to sell to land, send it to the landfill, where are we going to send it? We have three areas we go to. Compost, Green RU, who was mentioned earlier, great company. They helped us early on figure out how we were going to do it. Recycle and then also reuse. Compost. There's the buckets. Yeah. Orange. Orange is the color. Um, what do we send to compost? Organic solid waste, which is substantial. Um, food waste, prep back in the kitchen as well as table waste, um, tap room waste, napkins, expired menus, paper towels, you know, all of that stuff like discussed earlier. We make sure we get it going in the right direction. Recycle. What do we recycle? Uh, you know, plastics, metals, glass, the same thing you guys recycle at home. We just, you know, we make a point to do it. Um, we make a point to do it, and as you'll see later, we make it easy to do it, and that's probably the biggest key for us. Um, and Wright Environmental, a local company for us, they offer, they offer single stream right now, which is also super important because it allows us to keep this process simple for our staff. Spent, but not waste. So that's spent grain for you guys who don't necessarily know what the heck you're looking at there. That's what comes out of our tubs after we make more, which eventually becomes beer. Um, we take all the starch out of it. We take all of the carbohydrates out of it. Um, we take all the sugar out of it, essentially, is what we're trying to get. Uh, we convert it into simple sugar, which we then ferment. But there's a lot of good stuff left in that blue bin. Um, <coughs> and brewers everywhere know that. So we need to find a home for this kind of stuff. The landfill is not the place. We didn't have to invent that solution. It's been done for years. Uh, we had to figure out how we were going to get it out of our facility and get it to somebody effectively. So it's a byproduct of the brewing process. 100% of our spent grain is sent to local farmers. Um, that's really easy once you get the building ready to do that. Um, farmers want this stuff. 
where we're trying to go with it at this point in time is, you can see we've got mushroom, I love that one, that's a really good use for it. Problem is the mushroom farmer won't take it off because they don't grow enough mushrooms. So some goes to livestock. I like that, that's good reuse. You know it's not going to a landfill, right? Beef, and not the best use if you want to talk about big picture of that, you know, cattle and and that sort of thing is not the best for the environment. Uh, chicken's a little better, so we sent in some chicken guys. Um, we're working on trying to find a better home for all of that, but we are proud that none of it goes to the landfill. So how do we do it all? Um, for us, it started with the design. The biggest key being ease of use. So it was a new project, so we knew we were going to have to do something. It's not like we had to modify an existing restaurant have no more cash flow coming in, but just kind of fix the way the restaurant was handling it. We didn't have to do that. We were creating a restaurant and brewery. So it did cost us a little bit more to do it, but since it was a, a new construction project, it didn't cost us that much more to get this accomplished. But the key being here that I really want to talk about is we spent a lot of time talking about ease of use for staff. So as we dial down on it, the keys for us, locate bins properly. That means a lot of bins. Anywhere somebody can get rid of trash, make sure they can compost, make sure they can recycle. You don't want to make them walk across the room to recycle or compost because one, they may not care so they won't do it. Sad, I mean, sad but it's true, right? Two, it may be super busy and they just skip it. Uh, those numbers change dramatically if you don't make it easy for them to get to the stuff. Um, size bins properly. Why that's important for us is when we are really busy, we are a restaurant, we do have you know, high volume hours. If those compost bins are full, they're going to the next bin with the stuff. We don't want that to happen, right? We spend all the time and energy getting this set up. Make sure the bins are sized properly. Um, <coughs> if anybody's gonna tackle something like this, they have to understand that adjustments to the building infrastructure may be necessary. Um, <coughs> if you're gonna do it, you probably wanna do it right. And that's going to get into a complicated math equation at that point in time, factoring ROI back into it, because you may have to think about new construction costs. But it's not so complicated that you can't figure it out. Um, and then, yeah, new construction versus existing facility modification. New construction obviously makes that a little bit easier to do. Culture for us is big. So if these people don't want to participate, um, that's a problem. So. We talk about it in hiring. We also talk about it at staff orientation. And then at all staff meetings, which we have relatively regularly at this point in time, uh, we make sure we have a sustainability discussion point inserted into the agenda. So maybe it's just a reminder, like, hey guys, make sure you're using these right. Or like, hey guys, are these working all right? Are we sized right? Are, are things going smoothly for you? Are these, is these functioning for you? Um, hey, who's got a good idea of what else we can do? You know, anything like that. Or, or just throw numbers at them, like, hey guys, we've sent this much stuff off, of, off the compost this year. That means it didn't go to the landfill, and, and here's what that really means. But we just make sure we have a light discussion point on that all the time to kind of further, you know, it, it keeps top, top of mind awareness there for them, but it also just kind of becomes a part of the meeting and a part of our corporate culture. Brendan doesn't look so excited, but I think he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best picture we have. Uh, so much better than diversion. They talked about this a little bit already earlier uh, as well. But obviously avoiding the creation. So like, don't bring that stuff in um, if you don't need it. You know, try, try not to create stuff that's going to landfill, and then you're going to be like so wise by paying to compost it. Just don't create it at all. Um, a couple of the little things that we do. We make non-necessary restaurant items available upon request only. So straws, if you come to our place, you don't get one unless you ask for one. I mean, you can drink without straw, right? Extra napkins, they come out when you ask for them, but otherwise you get one. You know, you make a mess, we'll bring you a stack. You know, we don't have a problem with that, but we just don't fill them. We don't put them, we don't make them accessible, and we don't put a bunch out for you. Um, to go somewhere, we don't give you at all unless you ask for it. You know, we'll ask you, hey, you need to go somewhere today? But just little things like that. Um, and then, then you go next level on that. We also have to buy less straws, we have to buy less napkins, and we have to buy less to go somewhere. So that's a positive for us financially. 
portion appropriately. That's a huge one in the restaurant industry. And anytime you go to a restaurant or a brew pub conference at this point in time, there'll be a speaker talking about it. Don't give people so much food. And, and you'll know if you're giving people too much food because you keep waste logs and you watch what comes back. And a lot of it's going into the, hopefully the compost bin. <laughs> but if you don't have one, the garbage. Um, and monitoring uh, order control on all perishable products is important as well, making sure your staff is bringing in what you need, not what they think you need, but what you really need. And that's about tracking that. Better than the version of importing creation, uh, we brag a little bit about this one. We like these plans. These are unique solutions for us and also marketing opportunities. We call this one our plan to save the planet one kid's cup at a time. So I'm drinking beer out of one of those kid's cups. I hope nobody's offended. Uh, the other one's for smaller children. But with this plan, we reduce disposable cup purchases and we create a talking point for parents and kids. So when you come into our restaurant in uh, Waterloo, Iowa, if you purchase one of these cups, every time you come back, your kids' meal's free. So we don't, one, we get kids excited about having this cup, right? <laughs> Two, they want to come back to the restaurant, that's positive. You know, and they want an opportunity to bring their own cup and you guys have kids, right? You know how this goes. Um, three, we don't have to buy those kids' cups. Four, they don't have to go to the landfill or a compost bin, they make that stuff, that stuff's expensive. You know, we buy the stuff that we do use, if you don't purchase one of these that's compostable, that's not cheap stuff to buy. We do have, we didn't give you anything at all, just had you bring a cup on it. So yeah, we like that plan. Uh, we took it a step further, our plan to save, our plan to save the planet one canvas tote at a time. Because plastic bags are no good, right? Paper's not any better, really. Uh, we use these for to-go orders. So a uh, smaller impact for us, we're more of a dining restaurant, not a, we don't have a drive through window, we don't have a ton to go going out. But um, we've bought, we're selling our first, first case of to-go bags at this point in time. I think that's pretty good, because I don't like to see them go out in there. Um, from a marketing perspective, these things are great. The community loves these. You know, they rally around it, they talk about it, they're tweeting about it. Community Main Street's tweeting about it. The city then grabs it, they're tweeting about it. Next thing you know, you see a Facebook post, like a whole family with these out in front of the restaurant, the kids with the kids' cups. I mean, putting a price on that, I don't, I don't know what you really pay for that kind of marketing and that kind of community involvement just by offering this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's what I've got, it looks like I've got. <laughs> Those are beers. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dave, very much. I guess, first of all, is there any questions coming from out here? Anybody? I've got a couple I, I have, but I'd like to have anyone out here first. Nothing? Okay, well, I'm going to grab the mic and sit down over here. I've got a few questions. And if you have anything, please pipe up, let me know. We've got these guys for another almost half hour, so let's put them to work here. Um, one thing that I noticed is talk about culture, buy-in, you start a new construction, you guys come in and you work with other, other businesses that are doing this, and you've made the decision, we're going to do this in one year. How do you get a team of hourly employees that are working on the lines doing this in a manufacturing facility to buy it? I mean, you mentioned dollars and cents, but does the guy making 15, 20 bucks an hour down on the line working it really care about that investment of the owners? I mean, please share about that. How do you get them to buy it? Um, you might start with the uh, owners or managers. So our industry is addicted to cutting headcount. That's the way to save money. That's the way to make more profit is to have less people. The trouble is the people who are left are so busy keeping the wheels on the thing that they can't improve it at all. And so say like that Campbell's <coughs> example, that's $700,000 a year of additional profit. For $700,000 every year of additional profit, couldn't you afford to, right? And then if you engage the people on the line, you know, uh, many of our staff have you know, worked on Toyota production lines or wherever before. It's actually more interesting if you do a broader job. So once you engage, so <laughs> actually Alex's manager was at one of the factories we worked for, and he was a QA manager for a wine kit place. We went in, we increased the yield of the factory by 20% without buying any more grapes, just by preventing what was going down the drain. 
He was so excited, I didn't know. He quit, went back to school, then applied and joined us. And he's now Alex's man. And so it's much more exciting and engaging, actually. You know, these staffing meetings you have where you bring that up every time, get that into the habit, that's great, right? And environment isn't the top of everybody's list, but it's on their list somewhere, right? There's very few people that it's not on their list somewhere. It might not be the top priority, but it's actually a point of engagement across silos in your organization. You know, maintenance, QA, whatever, can agree on that, right? Particularly if it's profitable. And really, say Campbell Soup's the that plants in Toronto. Their biggest competitor is actually other Campbell's plants, right? So if you're at a Tyson plant, your biggest competitor is actually other Tyson plants. It's not the competitor because, you know, if so-and-so can make it half a cent cheaper in Georgia versus Nebraska, right, that's the competition. So you want to embed as much efficiency in your factory as possible to make it as hard as possible for somebody to make a silly decision up top. Oh, we're going to waste everything we've invested so far and start over somewhere else. And so it's really job protection. And again, people don't realize, we'll pay the sanitation crew minimum wage. Even though they're using twice as much energy and water on those hoses with no nozzles on it to clean the factory and to push the stuff down the drain, then if we gave them a decent wage and training, and show them how to do it correctly. So people don't realize that you know, a well-equipped and retained force can actually improve your factory more than just having them do a widget. And Michelle, if I were to can you speak on that? You went through the uh, idea of just a change within a year, not hiring new like-minded yeah. staff like they talked about. We were ISO 14001 certified first, and we had green teams. And that's in every um, department within our facility was on a team. And we had to come up with ideas of how do we become landfill free? How do we do it? And so all of those uh, departments worked together to come up with suggestions. And then we went to our team members and we told them, this is what we want to do. We want to go landfill free. This is why we want to do it. And we started talking to them about landfills, um, where landfills are, are sited. When a landfill gets full, what do they have to do? They have to buy more land. And where does the money come from? It comes from our communities as well. Um, and so we started talking to them about why did we want to do this? Yeah, we want to do it for Wesley Reed Foods, but we want to do it for the community as well. And a lot of our team members came to us and said, our children are, are saying that we should do this because at school they're learning how to recycle, how to make sure that this is going on. And so our team members were actually excited about it. We had some games that we played with them up at the cafeteria and everybody at lunch took their, their lunches and we recycled them in the containers. We have 18 containers that are in our cafeterias um, so that our janitors don't have to haul so much uh, weight out of any of them so that each one of them are like half full so that we don't have any injuries from people doing that. So we have this huge long line and I wish I would have um, put a picture up of it, but it's this huge long line of recycling containers in our, in our cafeteria. Each one of those people then would go up and put their recycling into one of those containers. If they did it right, they got a, they got a POP certificate. If they didn't do it right, we, we talked to them about what they should have done, and they still got a POP certificate. So we made it fun. We, we all had a good time in the, in the cafeteria. We also, when we went landfill free, we gave them an extra 45 minute lunch. We catered in the lunch. We did uh, compostable uh, materials from Green RU. Um, we had it all compostable out there. We celebrated with our team members. We gave everybody a landfill free uh, t-shirt and they're still wearing them today. And so I, that just shows us how important it is to them as well. And they can tell their communities <coughs> that they work for West Liberty Foods, who is a landfill free company. You know, not in particular, we just try to engage. Just. I mean, green teams are awesome. We, we, we haven't established stuff like that. We're, we're small enough where we think we've got control of it right now, and, and who knows if we really will in a year, and, and if we establish things like that, but we looked into those too, and those are a super tool. Um, yeah, we're, we're pretty on top of that stuff right now just because it's, we talk about it all the time. You know, it's on our menus, it's on our, you saw our two flyers, you know, it, it's kind of built in right now, so we've been able to just kind of use what we put in place and, and keep on going. And, 
so far so good. I guess the next thing I, I'm curious about is an competitive advantage for you, for, for you, Michelle, and then also for your clients. Do you see a competitive advantage once you've implemented these other ones and some of the, the social media you know, kind of response that you've seen from some of your stuff? Does, does that give you an advantage over you know, the growing craft, craft beer craze here in Iowa? Does that give you an advantage by being able to brag about and talk about all the, the, the great things you do environmentally? For, uh, for us, those things are probably really tough to track. Um, I think it resonates with people. I mean, not everyone, of course, but I think it resonates with people. It's a focus point for us. It's important to us, and, and we use it at, as a marketing tool as well. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it works well for New Belgium, right? They've done all right. Um, but you don't see everybody doing that. You don't see everybody putting it forward, and you don't see a lot of Iowa breweries putting it forward either. So we do... We do plan on continuing to speak about it as often as possible for many reasons, and that's one of them. Um, it is hard to track because we don't know if that's, it's always uh, in our minds that we did that, but um, what our CEO did it for was because it was the right thing to do. He just saw landfills, and we had huge impacts on those landfills. We'd go out to them, and we could tell that we had an impact on our community landfills. But um, I will say that Walmart actually um, called us after we did our first press release, and this is unheard of in Walmart, um, that they actually called us and said, hey, we want to have an appointment with one of your salespeople because you guys are on the same track as what we want to be um, with other suppliers and other vendors. Um, and that's kind of an unheard of thing. Applegate is another one of our uh, customers. And they're working with me right now. They, they are going through their whole company, talking about Wesley Foods. Uh, we're doing some products for them. They want to do more products because we're focused the same way they are on sustainability. So we are seeing some advantages to being sustainable. You're, when you go out there to the, to the real world, it's on price for everybody. But what else do you have besides price that you can give to these customers? And if you're at the same price level as somebody else, what do you have? that somebody else doesn't have. And sometimes that's our sustainability. Yeah. Um, reminder, the auto sector up in Canada. So back in 2008, everybody remembers the crash, right? But for a decade or two decades before that, our auto sector, uh, like the suppliers, they would not implement anything unless it was one year payback. And then for the last five years before that, they wouldn't implement it unless it was a six month payback. So we want our money back before the end of the year which sounds nice, except what's happening is you're leaving all this opportunity all over your factory that if anybody else happens to implement, as soon as the crash happens, you're gone. So we had a customer, uh, by implementing this stuff, he went from 4.3 to 8% margin. So he doubled his profit, even though his sales went down during the crash, right? And most of his competitors went out of business because um, just the way economics works. and so. People don't realize that it's not, for whatever reason people are taught, it's economics or environment, which one you want to do. If you want to succeed in environment, economic, you need to trash the environment. No. Actually, the companies that are succeeding, so the maybe if we just did 33 factories, 230,000 per factory of additional profit. That's job protection for every employee in those factories. Right? Now, this top line is very strong also. You know, if, if you can get a Walmart to contact you, you can't buy that kind of advertising, right? And so there's top line, there's bottom line, and, pe and the people who don't get it are going to be gone. I'm just going to add one thing too, Bruce. Um, in terms of competitive advantage, just, it goes back to culture as well. One of the projects we worked on was um, Tim Hortons plant that made the fruit jelly for the donuts and the, the muffins. Initially hired us to build or design a wastewater treatment facility. Instead, we went into the plant, reduced their their product waste, electricity, natural gas, whatnot, half a million dollars a year in savings, and they ended up um, giving all employees and it was a four thousand dollar bonus that year because they all bought into this process and generated this this additional profit. So then you have a workforce behind you now that's that's providing you with, with great work and uh, everyone's engaged, so that also provides a competitive advantage as well, internally, so. Do we have any questions from out here yet? I have one for Dave. Do you explore different types of products that you have that are really, you got a really 
short answer to that, no, we haven't. <laughs> uh, do, you know, do you know about? Well, in, in Illinois, you can't, uh, brewers in Illinois can't send their spec grains to the animals. Um, like you have that activity here. So I know some brewers who are actually sending their spec grains to Indiana from Chicago so they can go towards the production of ethanol and bio And I would assume that's I would guess so. I, I mean, and there are ethanol plants across the state. I think we know that. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's a volume level for them. If they would need so much to make it worth their time to come on out, but we haven't had anybody reach out to us in in terms of that. And I don't know where that would fall on the scale either of the best thing to do. I think from what I've read, the best thing to do would be to give it to a farmer that wants to farm appropriately and just have it scatter it all over his field and let it and let it do goodness out there. But um, that's interesting. So now it's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What are some components to uh, the green certification of the brew? Or what would it take to go from sil silver to platinum? Um, it's based on, uh, I could answer that since I kind of run that program as well. So um, <laughs> um, more or less the way, the way it works is we, we worked with, I think it was 14 different breweries across the state as well as the state brewers go when we developed this certification. And we worked with them by, by surveying them on all these various environmental components. And then we looked at, um, we had them rate these things, what is the easiest to implement and what is the most effective. And then we gave scores to each one of these where a higher score would be stuff that was not necessarily easy to implement and also effective and vice versa. If it was easy to implement, didn't have that much of an impact, still a good thing, um, then it would be worth fewer points. Prime example would be installing LED bulbs. Uh, it's simple, easy to do, very beneficial, so it's up there in weight a little bit um, on the score. We look at four different components, energy efficiency, water conservation, um, kind of just overall general environmental record keeping and, and data collection, and then also uh, solid waste management. So that's kind of, we, we have these four different components we go through, we do an audit, and then it's, it's more than just an audit. It's also, I hope would attest, it's one-on-one -on -one assistance to, to help answer any questions, to walk you through if there's any permitting issues that you need and whatnot and stuff like that. So. That's what that program is. We have some information if you go over to the, in our break that's coming up in a few short moments, well, there's some information about the brewery project in the uh, IWRC's booth in the exhibit hall. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience here? I have one more for all of you, is what's the, what's like the most difficult situation or the biggest hurdle that you've had to get over, whether it's, um, on the environmental side of things, whether it's consulting with the company with your one-year deadline or you just started from scratch. You know what, that if, if we got any folks out here that are thinking about doing that, what's, what's something that they can probably expect and how did you get over it? I think our biggest hurdle was that we didn't have anybody on our team, including myself, that knew how to get where we wanted to go. So we had to just understand that we need, we need to lean on some people here. So we brought people in. I mean, you guys helped a lot. I mean, we brought guys like you in that came in and gave us some guidance, you know. We had to learn, and, and you had to learn as quickly as you could, could so you could make decisions. Um, it's like these guys, I mean, they would be people you would bring in and, and would give you invaluable assistance. Um, once I understood that, uh, and, and you learned that pretty quick, then the process becomes a lot easier, but you have to buy into it on the front side of that. I was luckily in a position where I was in charge of making the decisions and I could, buy, I could buy in on my own. I didn't have to talk to anybody about doing it. You know, I could buy in on my own. But that was the biggest thing, is understanding that you need people that know what they're doing to guide you on it. And then, and to provide you with valid input, like not only like what you should do, but talk about the return on investment. You know, talk about those financial things that aren't fun discussions when you're talking about environmentally friendly practices. You know, they cost money. But let's find out like what it's gonna take to get that money back. And then, and then use that information accordingly. I think for me it's uh, when you identify somewhat obvious opportunities with a lot of uh, financial payback, often someone gets blamed for that. It's how come this has been happening? How come, whose fault is it kind of thing? So that's often a challenge for us in the process is um, that 
someone typically ends up getting blamed for this waste, even though it's they're just working hard to keep the ship running and they, they don't have time or any resources to address these things. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely an issue for us is, is how to work with our clients, really, and make sure that it's presented as a, an opportunity, not as a, as a fault of someone's. Um, that reminds me of, sometimes if it's not a privately owned facility, it's a corporately owned one, it's actually hard to implement something with a payback of under one year. So when we uh, go back and audit what's getting implemented, very often it's the stuff with the payback longer than one year, which is kind of strange, right? But what happens is if you're a facility and you put in a capital request to corporate, if it's over one year, great, here's the capital, go hire somebody, go do it. If it's under one year, oh, that's an expense. Do with your own maintenance budget, with your own people, and after you save the money, we'll send it over there instead. And so the very best stuff that would help all the people in the factory doesn't get implemented just because of our corporate structure. Um, and then the other challenge we have is um, our society is addicted to cures. And uh, whether it's health care with the safe water, whether it's food, composting, digesting, whether it's energy, solar, cogen versus not using it. And so most of our job is actually education of, yes, there's a place for that for sure, but don't waste your energy more efficiently, <laughs> right? I think our hardest um, part of going landfill free was we have uh, um, meat barrier films in, the, in our industry. And one of the things we had a problem with was that meat barrier film does not recycle with recyclers. They can't recycle the different layers of it. And one of the places that we could uh, actually recycle it in was a waste energy a, a kiln, cement kiln. And their problem with our product was that it was too wet. So we had to come up with a solution of how do we get that, that uh, from all the proteins off of that uh, plastic. And that's where our green team came in, our engineers. We came up with uh, a lot of different ideas. I mean, we were cooking footballs of uh, plastic in the oven upstairs, <laughs> trying to come up with different ideas of how can we do this. Um, we actually got another vendor, and I will say if you're gonna go landfill free, you're gonna do anything on recycling, get with your vendors that you currently use and you currently are with. A lot of them have those resources, they can help you. Um, I will waste exchange. I have to put in a, a little thing for Julie, um, who helped us also. Um, they're very good at getting you information um, about that. And that's my suggestion is to go with that. We ended up finding a, a vendor in uh, North Dakota. And uh, we sent a whole load of the worst possible plastic we could up there. They did it for us. We bought the, the machine. It was like $250,000, and we purchased it. And then we could go landfill free at our last facility. So that was our problem. Do we have any other questions for the audience or anything? Well, we've got about five minutes before the official break starts over in the exhibit hall. So it looks like there might be a little <laughs> bit of samples left over. So I would say thank you for thank you for attending. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And let's give these folks a nice round of applause. And thank you all very much for taking part.